quality of life in the future will depend on our energy future. In this episode, I'll introduce the key issues about our energy future. Welcome to episode one of our energy future. I'm your host, Tushar. Before diving into the main topic, I will share some basic information about this channel and my experience in the energy field. So why this channel and why now? There's a lot of information floating around about energy and related issues. But a large fraction of this information is misleading or localized. My goal is to share robust information about all the crucial issues related to our energy future. The timing is especially relevant given the massive global focus on mitigating climate change. So why me? I believe it is because of my passion and relevant experience. I am a second generation energy scientist. My dad's career in energy research spanned over 40 years. My passion for energy R&D comes from my dad. Inspired by him, I wanted to become an energy scientist since I was very young. And that is the path I followed. I have over 25 years of experience in addressing environmental issues related to energy. This includes a wide range of technologies related to low carbon energy and petroleum feedstocks. I retired from the R&D division of a multinational energy company in early 2019. Before I retired, my role was to lead a team of scientists and engineers to provide research guidance to the research projects in the organization and evaluate novel technologies. One key component of my role was to share knowledge. I liked the knowledge sharing aspect of my role so much that I decided to take an early retirement and expand my knowledge sharing efforts by writing books, articles, and via videos. For more information about my books, papers, patents, awards, and honors, please visit my website. With that, it is time to move to the main topic. To understand our energy future, we need to first understand our current state and how we got here. So let us talk about our energy now. Energy, of course, drives our day-to-day -day life. It is required to grow food, to produce all our goods, for construction and building our infrastructure, to transport people, food and goods, and to power devices and equipment at our homes and workplaces. All of this requires a lot of energy. Currently, we use more than 600 exajoules of primary energy per year. So how large is this amount? One way to visualize the total amount of energy we use is by comparing it to the food consumed by the global population. We have 8.1 billion people on Earth. It is easy to imagine that these 8.1 billion people consume a lot of food. So how much food is consumed per year? About 50 exajoules of food. And this includes waste. Meaning our global energy consumption is more than 10 times that of our food consumption. It is also valuable to compare our energy use with some very widely used materials. We use enormous amounts of plastic, steel, and cement. Notably, our energy use is more than that of plastics, steel, and cement all combined. Where does all of this energy come from currently? Fossil fuels, namely coal, oil, and natural gas, contribute to roughly 82% of the energy we use. Nuclear contributes to about 4% and all the forms of renewable energy combined contribute to about 14%. How did we get here? Our journey can be best understood by looking at how the global economy has evolved over time. The gross domestic product or GDP is a useful indicator of the economy. GDP of a region is the value of goods and services produced in that region. Here, we'll mainly discuss GDP per capita. This term is more relevant when discussing the global economy over a long time frame. GDP per capita of a region is simply the GDP of the region divided by the total population of that region. As we can see from the figure, the GDP per capita was almost flat until the last couple of centuries. But after that, there was an exponential increase in the GDP per capita. Energy has played a major role in this increase. For 1800 years, the primary source of energy was biomass such as wood, waste crop, and animal manure. Humans used biomass for heating and cooking. For most other purposes, the global society used either human labor or animal labor. Such inefficient use of energy kept the society very busy just meeting their basic needs. This limited the progress of the human society. 
but everything changed after humans learned how to efficiently harness energy from fossil fuels. Fossil energy was used to fuel machines which could do the work of many men and animals. This mechanization of operations was crucial. Because of this, a much smaller fraction of the population was needed to meet the basic needs of the society. Many now had the time for other pursuits such as making medical and technology advances. There was a further increase in productivity with ongoing technology innovation. The global energy use increased rapidly to support the rise in productivity. This resulted in the exponential increase in global productivity. The Average Human Development Index or HDI which is based on parameters such as standard of living, health, and education, improved rapidly over this time. For example, the average life expectancy was less than 30 years in the 18th century. Today, the life expectancy is over 70 years. But the progress of the society has not been equal in all countries. Some countries have progressed far more than others. This brings us to a very important challenge for our society, the energy challenge. The energy use per capita of a country is an important attribute for this discussion. It is simply the total energy used by the country divided by its population. Those countries with a high energy use per capita have prospered, while those with a low energy use per capita have not progressed as much. Currently, the global average energy per capita is roughly 80 gigajoules. All the high income countries have a higher energy use per capita than the global average. These countries also have a very high human development index. Examples in this category are the United States, Canada, Australia, Japan, South Korea, and many countries in Europe. On the other end, the low income countries have a lower energy use per capita than the global average. These countries have a much lower human development index. Examples in this category are many countries in Africa, Asia, and South America. Let us review a couple of examples. The energy use per capita in India is only a third of the global average. The energy use is even lower in many other countries. For example, the energy use per capita in Nigeria is roughly one-tenth of the global average. Unfortunately, most countries fall in this low energy use category. These countries will need access to a large amount of affordable energy to achieve a human development index for the citizens, which is high. Such lack of access to affordable energy for a large fraction of the global population is a major challenge. This has important implications. This means that a substantial increase in energy cost will greatly worsen the energy challenge. Also, the impact of high cost will not be limited to developing countries. It will also have a substantial impact on low income and middle class population in developed countries. This is because the energy cost also has an impact on the cost of all goods and services. Let us review the climate challenge next. Tens of thousands of scientists have studied the topic of climate change over the last several decades. Through these efforts, the scientists have found with a high confidence that a continued use of fossil fuels is causing a rise in Earth's temperature and several other impacts related to climate change. The massive increase in energy use in recent centuries has played a major role. Our primary energy use increased from just 20 exajoules to over 600 exajoules over the last two centuries. Most of this energy came from the combustion of fossil fuels. The massive use of fossil fuels by the global society has resulted in the release of more than 1700 billion tons of CO2 since the Industrial Revolution. Activities such as deforestation has also contributed to the increase in emissions. Combined, the human activities have resulted in an increase of about 2,500 billion tons of CO2. A large fraction of the CO2 has accumulated in the atmosphere. This has led to an increase in the CO2 content of the atmosphere. The increase in CO2 and other greenhouse gases has disturbed the delicate heat balance of our planet and is causing climate change. Virtually all major scientific organizations in the world recognize climate change as a serious problem that must be dealt with urgently. IPCC, a United Nations body, was formed specifically to advise global governments about climate change. Their primary recommendation is to drastically cut greenhouse gas emissions, which essentially means a transition from a fossil fuel energy system to a low carbon energy system. 
the global governments are being pushed to develop policies to limit the Earth's average temperature rise to well below 2 degrees Celsius, preferably to 1.5 degrees Celsius. To meet such limits, the global energy system will need to achieve net zero emissions within the next several decades. Net zero emissions means reducing greenhouse gas emissions to as close to zero as possible, with the remaining being removed from the atmosphere. So essentially, the climate challenge is driving our energy future. So where are we headed? More than 145 countries already have a net zero emissions target. These countries cover roughly 90% of the global economy and population. This basically means that there is a global agreement to urgently transition to a net zero system. This tells us that our energy future will mainly involve low carbon technologies, that is technologies that emit little to no greenhouse gases. But the complete transformation of our energy system cannot be done quickly. It will take decades. This journey to the new energy system or how we make the transition is of prime importance. It is perhaps the most crucial aspect of our energy future. The energy transition will involve three main steps. One, a shift from fossil fuel power to low carbon power. Two, electrification or replacement of technologies that use fossil fuels with technologies that use electricity. A popular example is a replacement of conventional cars with electric cars. And three, decarbonization of applications that are difficult to electrify. Examples are air travel, ships, and certain high temperature industrial applications. Each of these steps involves multiple options. Let us consider the power sector. We can choose from multiple low carbon power technologies in this sector. For example, solar power, wind power, biopower, hydropower, nuclear power, natural gas power with carbon capture and storage, tidal power, and geothermal power. This leads to two key questions. The first key question is, which of these technology options should we use? And the second key question is, what should be the level of use of each technology option? As we discussed earlier, the transition involves three main steps. Now, each of these steps is associated with multiple technology options. This leads to the third key question. In what sequence should we deploy the technology options associated with the three steps? Should we focus on deploying te technology options from all steps simultaneously or stagger the deployment? Finally, the fourth and perhaps most important question. What should be the overall speed of the energy transition? The success of our journey from where we are now to a low carbon energy system depends on how we respond to these critical questions. Basically, our energy future depends on the policies that will be used for the energy transition. Only energy policies that are based on a robust response to the critical questions will be able to meet the climate challenge as well as the energy challenge. Such policies will ensure a good outcome, while poor energy policies will lead to a bad outcome. So it is crucial that the public supports robust energy policies and opposes poor energy policies. But how to know if an energy policy is robust? This requires a good understanding about all the crucial aspects of energy. The intent of this channel is to provide that very information. The discussions in this channel will consider all the crucial aspects of the science and practical issues of energy. A quick recap before I sign off. We use a massive amount of energy. Fossil fuels supply roughly 80% of this energy today. We face two major challenges, the energy challenge and the climate challenge. The climate challenge dictates that our energy future will involve a low carbon energy system. The journey to this low carbon energy system, which will take decades, is crucial for a bright energy future. There are four critical questions related to this crucial journey. Which technology options should we use? What should be the level of use of each technology option? In what sequence should we deploy the technology options? And finally, what should be the overall speed of the energy transformation? Only energy policies that are based on a robust response to these critical questions will be able to meet the climate challenge and the energy challenge. A wide global support for such robust policies will be critical for a bright energy future. That's it for today. We'll be back soon with another video to discuss more about our energy future.